Welcome to the Real Python Podcast. This is episode 119. How do you process and classify text documents in Python? What are the fundamental techniques and building blocks for natural language processing? This week on the show, Jody Birchall, developer advocate for data science at JetBrains, talks about how machine learning models understand text. Jody explains how ML models require data in a structured format, which involves transforming text documents into columns and rows. She covers the most straightforward approach, called binary vectorization. And we discuss the bag of words method, along with tools like stemming, lemmatization, and count vectorization. We jump into word embedding models next. Jody talks about WordNet, the natural language toolkit, word to vec and GenSim. Our conversation lays a foundation for starting with text classification, sentiment analysis, and building projects with these tools. Jody also shares multiple resources to help you continue exploring NLP and modeling. This episode is brought to you by Sneak. Sneak is the security platform designed for developers, securing the software development lifecycle from the tools and flows devs use. Sign up for free at sneak.co slash realpython. That's S-N-Y-K dot C-O slash realpython. All right, let's get started. The Real Python Podcast is a weekly conversation about using Python in the real world. My name is Christopher Bailey, your host. Each week, we feature interviews with experts in the community and discussions about the topics, articles, and courses found at realpython.com. After the podcast, join us and learn real-world Python skills with a community of experts at realpython.com. Hey, Jody, Welcome back. I'm excited to have you on the show. Yeah, I'm um, really happy to be here, and um, I'm super excited about the topic we're going to talk about today. Yeah, yeah. When you presented this stuff to me, I was like, oh, wow, this is going to be great. <laughs> There's so many questions I have already. And so um, we have like a shared document where we're kind of throwing stuff back and forth. So as usual, we'll have tons and tons of links. So if this is something that you have interest in exploring, I think we're going to give you a bunch of not only knowledge to kind of walk in and be a little more familiar with the topic, but also uh, maybe some good resources for you to play with this. Yeah, and and that's really my goal here. So I kind of came into natural language processing like cold. I, I didn't train in this at all. And this is what I was doing in my first job out of academia and industry. And when I first got started, I was like, what the hell? Like, how are you <laughs> gonna how are you gonna put a, a piece of text into a model? Like it didn't look anything like this tabular data that I was used to working with in previous work that I'd been doing. So what I'm kind of hoping is we can break things down a lot today and, and be very practical and and give people something that they can take away and, and try at home. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And that's, I think, going to be the goal for, you know, all the sort of data science topics that we go forward. Mm -hmm. I, I feel like there's a lot of people that converse about these things and it all seems so lofty and not mm -hmm. like touchable by the non-anointed monks of the field <laughs> <laughs> and we definitely want to break that 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 barrier and get you in and playing around with this stuff as much as you can because um, i think it's really fascinating and it, it allows you to at least understand it even if you know this isn't your focus per se, I still think there's some nice usable things. And also there's a lot of this technology being used on the fringe of all the stuff. And we'll, I definitely get into that too. Like where, where is this being used in our industry? So mm -hmm. cool. All right. So where do we start? <laughs> so um, I guess maybe we could start by having a chat around things that have been happening with natural language processing lately. So the one that comes to mind for me is you know, the, the stuff that was happening in June with this Google engineer who uh, basically thought that Lambda, the dialogue um, model, had become sentient. So do you know the story about that? Um, I know a little bit. I did not read. Uh, I haven't paid for my New York Times oh, subscription, no. <laughs> so I had to pay well pretty quick. But I did find a, an article, and I'll include that, that's on Medium. It's from 
Emily M. Bender, and uh, Mm -hmm. it basically, her article's titled On the NYT Magazine on AI, colon, resist the urge to be impressed. Um, And she's uh, done a bunch of uh, other, I I think this may be like a side thing. I feel like a lot of people have to do that today. Um, There's so much sort of hype around well, so many topics on the internet that there always has to be these handful of people that go, whoa, 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 hold on. (laughs) (laughs) Let's talk about this in context. Uh And she had another one recently that I thought was really good that she was, uh, she actually has a link inside that article too that was similar. And it was about how can AI driven voice analysis help identify mental disorders Hmm. and so she it's another new york times thing (laughs) and so she like had to kind of tear that one apart too and like explain like you know hashtag ai hype (laughs) Yes. so what was the story there because i again i didn't dig too deep into um the lambda thing so yeah there was basically uh an engineer called blake lemoyne Um, he was working testing lambda and lambda is a model that google says that they've developed in order to help power chatbots so what they did was yeah yeah they specifically trained it on a whole bunch of examples of dialogue so it means that you know if you if you use these kind of current generation language models they sound quite convincing but this one works better than others for having a conversation. Mm. So Lemoyne was testing out this uh, model and he's a, a spiritual guy. And when this model mentioned having a soul, he sort of started believing then, okay, this is a sentient you know, being, it's communicating with me, I want to protect it. You know, he had good intentions. Right. He tried raising ethical concerns within Google and they pushed back. So he published transcripts uh, from his conversations with Lambda outside the company and this was a breach of confidentiality. So Google fired him. So it's a really interesting story. And if you read the transcripts, they do kind of feel sentient. But I, I read through that article that you sent. This was written pre this whole Lambda hype. This was the, the article you sent was about another model, GPT-3, which we'll also be talking about. Yeah. But I read a, a really great article, which will also, well, I've, I've shared it with Chris. I'm guessing you're going to uh, oh, yeah, share it as it well. Too. Sure. Yeah. 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 Sounds good. And basically, this author, they gave this really wonderful description about why the sort of sentience that we see in these language models is not true sentience. And um, what they said was, you know, as humans, when we learn language, we learn it for a reason. So we learn it to express these sort of uh, feelings and behaviors we have within ourselves. So they gave an example of, you know, say I bite an apple. And I have a sensation that that apple is crunchy and sweet. I want to learn language to express these concepts. But language models learn language just by seeing all of these relationships between words in a sentence and learning the probability of them co-occurring. And it's done in this very deliberate way. It's not really done to express anything. It's done to mimic this process of what we do to express sentiment. So... It's fascinating, but it's all kind of an illusion. They don't have general intelligence yet. They just are very convincing. Yeah. Well, that that was what uh, it immediately made me go back in time and think about um, Eliza, um, mm-hmm. which was the <laughs> created in 1964 or 1966 mm-hmm. at MIT, and the. the It basically used pattern matching and this uh, idea of substitution methodology to basically create the illusion of, you know, talking to a psychotherapist. Mm -hmm. And so it would just like, you know, tell me more about that. You know, it would like, (laughs) yeah, it would just uh, ask these kind of good general questions like, you know, what is the connection, do you suppose? And um, yeah, yeah. can you think How... of a specific example? And it's like, you know, these are good questions that a therapist would ask, yeah. but they're not, they're not prompted on necessarily what you're truly saying. And, mm-hmm. you know, it's interesting. So, yeah. And there's a bunch of models of that that you can try out there. Um, it's, mm-hmm. a, it's a kind of a cool Python project, if you will, to build an Eliza. Um, <laughs> so I'll see if I can find a good Python example of it, but I've seen a few that are just running so but yeah it's Mm. we've been here for a while i guess uh (laughs) (laughs) yeah definitely so you wanted to kind of dive into you know kind of the understanding of this and going past like 
early things like Eliza and stuff like that to actually looking at text and speech and and seeing what's in it. And there's mm. a lot of sort of layers to it. And so we're going to do our best to kind of dig through them and see how far we can kind of get. And maybe we might split this up. We've talked about that already um, if yeah. we need to. <laughs> based on that because we don't want to overwhelm people with the, <laughs> <No>. <laughs> with the massive series exactly yeah <laughs> let's get in there so yeah so how do we even start to tear this apart yeah so i guess i as you said like i want to skip over sort of the earlier stuff and what i want to get started with is stuff that's still relevant now so i don't want to give a history lesson because that's not really useful what i want to start with is sort of how we can restructure text in such a way that it's useful for tasks like classification or sentiment analysis or anything that you might want to use for feeding into a machine learning model. And I want to talk about the ways that we can represent text in a way that a machine learning model can understand, starting from sort of the simplest approaches that people are still using and then working up to how you can actually get your hands on stuff like GPT or BERT and and be using these latest cutting edge models. Can we start with two quick definitions of classification and sentiment analysis? Yes, very good idea as well. And please pull me up because yes, I am so deep in this that no, it's, sometimes, it's so yeah, easy yeah. to do. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes, yes. So classification is basically when you want to sort a whole bunch of things into different boxes. So it might be, I don't know, um, I have a bunch of news stories and I want to classify what kind of topics they're about. So sports, crime, things like that. So yeah, that would be like a really classic um, text classification task, for example. Cool. And then sentiment analysis is where you try to find out the basic general feeling about a piece of text. So the most kind of common sentiment analysis will really just classify a te text as positive, neutral, or negative, or more positive or more negative. There are more kind of sophisticated sentiment analysis models. They're not as common, which might actually classify, you know, what, what type of emotion is this reflecting? Is it fear, sadness, things like that? But more, more commonly, it's this positive-negative divide. Yeah, we have a couple resources I'll share on that from Real Python that can kind of help people get an idea that take things like reviews, um, which is, I think, a mm. common tool that people can kind of use to at least start to play with the, the idea of sentiment and analyzing <laughs> the directionality of it, if you will. <laughs> so Yes, yes. Yeah. And sentiment analysis is actually a really fun problem. So it's a good place to get started with natural language processing in general. Going ahead with a bit of an orientation. So as I said, when I got started with natural language processing, I was so confused because I was used to working with tables and all of a sudden, you know, you had these blocks of text and it's like, well, <laughs> yeah. how, how do I get that into a table? Um, so you do need to transform text from a piece of text into something tabular and the rows and columns, depending on your approach, will represent different things. But the general idea is that the columns are always aiming to capture some sort of meaningful information about a piece of text. And ideally, what we're trying to do is mirror in some way the information that, like, when we're reading text, we would understand. Okay. Basically, what I'll be sort of taking you through today, maybe in two episodes, is that these successive generations of natural language processing approaches have just gotten better and better at capturing more of this information that we understand when we're reading. So, yeah, shall we kind of jump in with the, the first kind of approaches? Yeah, yeah. Let's look at that because that, that definitely is definitely what I was thinking about. Like, you know, what what do these columns and, and uh, rows per se mean and, and uh, kind of moving into it? And that definitely makes sense to me that, you know, you, you can't just take a raw paragraph and feed it no. into to, you know, a, a, a Python program and, you know, <laughs> yeah, have, yeah, yeah. understand it. So cool. <laughs> Yeah. And I used to always kind of think of it as like, you know, kids with that block game and it's like, you've got like a triangle and you're trying to shove a square in there. Like that's sort of how <laughs> I felt. <laughs> but, yeah. Right. yeah. Sneak doesn't just find vulnerabilities in your code. 
open source dependencies, containers, and cloud infrastructure. It also provides expert remediation advice and automatic fix PRs, so you can merge and move on knowing that your applications are secure. And since Sneak was designed for developers, it works right from your favorite dev tools, like PyCharm, Git, CLI, and more. Start your free forever account at sneak.co slash realpython. That's S-N-Y-K dot C-O slash realpython. So the first uh, approaches that I'll be talking about are kind of generally called bag of words. And the reason that they're called this is because the approach you're taking is trying to capture meaning about a text by looking at the words that it contains. You know, like it's a pretty straightforward idea, right? Like if I'm reading a piece of text and it mentions cats and dogs, yeah. I can probably infer that it's about pets. If I'm reading another piece of text and it's about, I don't know, wheat and corn, it's probably about grains. Yeah, so, yeah. Makes me yeah. think of the, you know, instead of like Scrabble being individual letters, there was like those poetry magnets that you could put on a refrigerator. Oh, yes, yes. <laughs> yeah, so just toss them all in a bag. <laughs> I, I used to live with a couple of liberal arts uh, students. And um, of course, we had several sets of those, especially the Shakespeare one. You know, it was like a <laughs> there you go. starter kit for liberal arts undergraduates. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, so the kind of most simple way to think about this is I have a bunch of documents. And what I do is I take every single word that occurs in those documents and I create a column for every single one. And then what my row represents is a document. And then what I do is I go along and I see whether the word occurs in that document or not. If it does, I put a one in the column. And if not, I leave it as zeros. So this is called binary vectorization. And it's basically the stupidest, most like naive approach you can take, but it does actually get you results if you've got pretty good separation between your documents. So like you want to do classification and you have your documents that are about crime tend to focus very heavily on words that are just about crime and your documents that are about sport tend to focus very very heavily on that, then it can actually get you pretty good predictions in a model. So I want to say it's a dumb approach, but sometimes dumb is fine. Sure. So what I do want to talk about though is you might already be seeing some issues with doing this. And the first issue is, like, if you think about a really big collection of documents, they're going to have, like, tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of words. And a lot of those are only going to appear once. And if you think about this, when we train machine learning models, what we're trying to do is get them to see patterns. So with this approach, if we have columns that represent words, what we want the machine learning model to learn is, okay, well, if the word cat occurs usually in documents that are about house pets, then okay, I can see that if a new document includes cats, I could probably classify it as about house pets. But if it only ever occurs once, then, you know, it's useless. Like, you don't want to include those words. So, one thing you can do to clean up is just include your N most common words in your collection of documents. Okay. So you're sort of like filtering and um, sort of setting a scale of saying this should be within, you know, this many times mentioned. Exactly. Exactly. And it sort of depends like with with these models, if you have more occurrences, especially if you've got lots of categories, if you think about it, it's better to have more than 10, maybe more than 15. It's There's no kind of formula for it, but it's not good to have like very rare terms that it just doesn't do much for the model. Okay. So the next thing I want to talk about is another problem, which is something you might have also thought about is if we're literally taking words, raw words, and we're splitting every single one into its own column, you're going to have problems where, say, cat and cats, which mean the same thing, end up in different yeah. columns. Yeah. <laughs> so Or feline or... or... <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. And we'll talk about how to solve for the feline problem um, in a second, but we can do some tricks to solve for the grammatical differences. So okay. one is called stemming, 
and another is called lemmatization, which is a ridiculous word. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so basically both of these are approaches where you're kind of trying to reduce words that mean the same thing. So like packing, packed, packs to the exact same root or stem. Stemming just does it in a kind of dumb way. Like it doesn't really do it in a grammatically correct way. Lemmatization, however, will apply proper grammar rules to try and, you know, correctly resolve something like am, are, and is to be. Okay. So stemming is is literally like kind of tearing the word apart and like you said, doing cat yeah. to cats. The stem of cats is just the word cat and yeah. there's an S in pluralizing it or whatever. Yeah. Or you know, if they're verbs, then you can think of the the I O N version. Yes, or, yeah, know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And then what's the lemmatization is more the meaning? Yeah. So lemmatization is more that it will actually ap- apply like correct grammar rules. So what it'll okay. yeah, what it'll do is it'll go through the text and be like, okay, this is a verb, this is a noun, this is an adjective. So if I want to do like I've, I want to take it back to its base form, which is called the lemma. I basically need to, oh, okay, I need to convert this particular verb in this way so that it's, you know, the infinitive form, the base form. And yeah, it's it's really effective in terms of like how it can actually convert text. But the issue is you can imagine like it's extremely expensive. So when you have huge amounts of text, lemmatization, I uh, I usually don't use it because it's just so expensive. Usually just go with stemming. You mean expensive as far as the time yeah, and the resources? Exactly. That it, it can eat up. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It is free to use through a package. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> Sorry, that's going to cost you. <laughs> yeah. Well, we will be coming to that later, but uh, luckily yeah, yeah, at the yeah, moment, totally. we're, not, we're not in that territory yet. Okay. Cool. And then the final is, again, when we're splitting every single word into its own column, we can miss meaningful combinations of words. Um, So I have a funny story about that, actually. So a couple of jobs ago, I worked at a job board and I was helping to improve the search engine. Okay. And um, this was a, a job board here in Germany. So at the time, we didn't have Rust developer as one of our search terms. And obviously, Rust and developer mean something very different to Rust developer. And um, when people search for Rust developer on the site, it got, <laughs> it got them results for developer jobs in this town called Hust in Germany, which had this theme park. And basically, like, <laughs> you got all these recommendations for jobs in this tiny little theme park in this town in the middle of nowhere in Germany. And yeah, not the language rust at all. So, um, (laughs) yeah. Was the name of the town like, like a synonym for rust or something? No, no, no. It it, it was rust. Yeah. It was the town. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) But, uh, all right. Yeah. I was thinking like rust developer could also be like something that you know, you get like painting jobs or you get yes. other kinds of weird yeah. um, <laughs> oxidation experts. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think we had a few of those as well. Um, it was a mess. But yeah, then one, once we, we figured that out, it was fine. And we actually gave the poor Rust developers their correct jobs back. <laughs> so you had to tie the words together in a yeah, way? Yeah, exactly. And this is called capturing n-grams. So n, okay. n basically means like it's a number. So it could be two grams and that's you know, terms that are comprised of two words, three grams, four grams. So trying to find a way of doing that effectively can actually clean up your columns a lot because then you're actually starting to group terms that mean something different of their composite words. So that takes me back one second to you said there's this initial set of columns that's, and we didn't define this, but like is all the words, yes, yes. <laughs> if you will. Yes. So there's some kind of basis for that, like some kind of uh, set that you would bring on board. And in this particular case, you are customizing it for this quote unquote job board purpose. Mm-hmm. And you're saying, okay, in this circumstance, I need to have, I need some presets for some additional n-grams here that, that makes sense. And they, and they may be used for other mm-hmm 
you know, other purposes, but in this case, I need to have some developer centric or job mm-hmm, specific mm-hmm. centric stuff. Okay, cool. Yeah. And to be honest, like getting n-gram statistically is quite hard. So we'll talk about it later, but the um, method or the sort of way of implementing this vectorization in Python does have a method that allows you to statistically try to detect n-grams. Okay. But they don't work that well. So kind of your best bet is if you have a list, like a pre-existing list of meaningful n-grams. And we got it obviously from search queries because, you know. Oh, what do people type? Um, we should yes. collect these. Okay. Okay. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. So kind of a form of training right there. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. You know, you're already inputting some meaningful information. So we've talked about binary vectorization. So just putting ones and zeros in the columns. But you probably realize that you're missing some information here. So, you know, how do you distinguish a piece of text where someone's talking almost entirely about cats, you know, like me in my daily life? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <Nice>. <laughs> <laughs> um, from a piece of text where it's just mentioned once. Yeah. Yeah. So instead, what we can do is just count the number of times that a piece of, or a word, sorry, occurs in a piece of text. This starts uh, introducing additional problems, though. I feel like I'm, you know, just bringing up so many problems that these (laughs) techniques have. They're actually really great. But it's it's interesting because you can start simple and keep refining based on how much of an issue these problems are causing for you. Well, it's nice to keep all these things in mind. Mm. and, And there are definitely things that I think of immediately, like, as a person who likes to solve problems, Mm -hmm. as a programmer, like, uh, how do you deal with this yeah. thing, you know? <laughs> how do you, you know, think about this? So it's good that we're kind of bringing them up. And I would guess, you know, anytime I've delved into data science packages, there's a huge amount of parameters that you are applying. And I, I'm guessing this is where a lot of these are going to come up, mm-hmm. go into the packages and, and mm-hmm. adjust things. Exactly. Um, and yeah, it's something we'll talk about when we talk about the Python packages that implement this. It's really simple to implement these methods and pretty much all of this stuff, like uh, you were saying, Chris, will be available as methods that you can just pass, uh, sorry, arguments that you can just pass to the method. So nice. yeah, 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 it's really nice. Cool. So now that we have our count vectorization where you've counted the number of times that a word occurs rather than putting a one or a zero, the biggest issue that comes up is the most common words in any piece of text are going to be joiner words things like the, a, we, they don't have any meaning. So these are called stop words. You might've heard that term. It's um, pretty common. Really, it's a very dumb approach to getting rid of this. Before you, you know, create your table with all of your counts, you just get rid of them. So you just have a list of the most common stop words in a language and you just remove them. So problem solved. That's also built in as part of the vectorization methods as well so i could see them like when you mentioned the words we and and like you i could see that depending on the purpose that you might have to adjust these stop words too but yes i don't know if that's the no case. no no okay. it's All totally right. true and like this is one of the reasons i like these approaches even though we have deep learning approaches that are perhaps slightly more sophisticated in how they represent language. These approaches are so intuitive and they're so easy to debug and understand. I think it, they're still very attractive to use and they're such an attractive starting point as well. Because again, like you don't have a background in this and already you can understand potential issues when you're processing the text. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, good. And then the final approach that I want to talk about in Bag of Words is called TF-IDF vectorization. I will explain. It's, it's pretty straightforward. This other issue that you might have with count vectorization, even after you've gotten rid of your stop words, is certain bodies of text will have terms that occur really frequently across all of the documents. So say we're dealing with this collection of news articles, the word current or the word people might come up really frequently. But they don't tell us anything about any specific piece of text. Hmm. What we want to do is upweight words that are rare across all documents. So they only occur in a few documents, but they're really frequent within those documents. And we want to downweight those words that are common across all documents. So that's what this TF-IDF vectorization does. 
TFIDF stands for term frequency inverse document frequency. And it's just a simple weighting that does that up weighting, down weighting that I just talked about. So the last issue that you need to solve for in bag of words approaches is texts tend to have different lengths. So documents can be wildly different in their lengths depending on the text that you're using to train on. So that means even after you've applied this uh, TFIDF vectorization, it can be really difficult to compare like how important a number is in one row compared to another because does a five in one document mean the same thing in another one? So what you can do is something called normalization. It basically means that you do almost kind of like it's not quite a percentage, but it's almost like what you do is you apply across a document a weighting to each of the words so that you're like, oh, okay, the word cats took up 15% of the words in this document. The word, I don't know, dog took up another 10%. So it basically means that five in one document means basically the same thing as it does in another one. So it's much easier to compare them. Okay. Would that also deal with the idea of the length of the document? Like if you're inserting, you know, let's say like blog posts that are, I don't know, a couple thousand words Mm -hmm. versus the ones that are 10,000 or 20,000 words that the frequency of these words being in them, is that like something where you can sort of apply um, a normalization based on the actual number of overall words yeah yeah and that's exactly what it's for so basically okay. yeah it's the idea that i want to compare something that's twice as long or 10 times as long yeah but okay. yeah it doesn't make sense to do raw counts or even weighted counts in that case okay cool so shall we talk about how to do this in python yeah definitely <laughs> <laughs> so basically SK Learn. SK Learn is one of my favorite packages in Python. You can implement all of this in just a few lines with the feature extraction.txt module. So there's specific methods for count vectorization and TF-IDF vectorization. And as we've already talked about, both of those methods contain arguments to do things like limit the number of words to the top n, to try and capture n-grams, to get rid of stop words, and to do that normalization I just talked about. So you don't really need to think that much. It's really simple, and it's it's actually pretty fast, even on large amounts of text. What would be a project that somebody could approach that with? Like what, like we mentioned a little bit, like sentiment analysis might be one. Mm. Can you think of other like? small scale projects. Mm -hmm. Like you mentioned the other thing, I I think of, (laughs) I think of the deluge of news and like, okay, I want to group it and Mm -hmm. I want to like, like let's toss all the political stuff over there Mm -hmm. to a moment where I'm willing to deal with it. Um, Mm -hmm. (laughs) But let's put entertainment here. (laughs) Yeah, 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 yeah. So you, this is actually a classic text classification project. It's, uh, I think it's called the Reuters uh, text uh, news corpus, the Reuters news corpus. Oh, cool. Yeah. And there's like two tutorials on how to do it. So that's a great one to get started with. I think classification projects in general are really fun to get started with. Okay. So kind of like, you know, tout these methods a bit. At this job that I was talking about, I used these techniques pretty commonly. I actually did a project relatively recently where I built a hate speech classifier and I got Mm. 80% accuracy using just these methods to pre-process the text. So like it really is about your data. If your data is easy to represent just with words, then these techniques, you can't really go wrong with them. So cool. Yeah. All right, that gives some some stuff for people to play with and I'll try to find a couple projects we can tie in. And then, like I said, I think a couple of these real Python articles mm. have a lot of these things and repeat them that you can kind of come in and play with them a little bit. Yeah. This week, I want to shine a spotlight on another real Python video course. The course is based on a topic we cover in depth this week. It's titled Learn Text Classification with Python and Keras. It's based on a tutorial by Nikolai Yanikiev, and in the course, instructor Douglas Starnes takes you through getting started with Scikit-Learn and Keras, how to define a baseline model using pre-trained word embeddings, determining the mood of a piece of text through sentiment analysis, 
What are convolutional neural networks? And starting to tune hyperparameters. If you're interested in exploring natural language processing and sentiment analysis, I think this is a worthy investment of your time. And like all the video courses on Real Python, it's broken into easily consumable sections. Plus, you get additional resources and code examples for the techniques shown. All of our course lessons have a transcript, including closed captions. Check out the video course. You can find a link in the show notes, or you can find it using the enhanced search tool on realpython.com. All right. So what happened uh, next? <laughs> <laughs> One thing that uh, you already mentioned is this feline cat overlap, right? So those words are basically synonymous, but we treat them like they're completely independent. And we all know language, unfortunately, doesn't work like that. So um, what we're losing here is quite a lot of the context. And that context can be important in how we process text. So the way that people dealt with this prior to deep learning really being a thing in natural language processing was what they do is they would manually create these huge databases which group words by their meaning. And okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. So they're really cool projects. Like linguists have put a lot of time and effort into this sort of stuff. So the most commonly used one, and it's still an active project, is called WordNet. And it's currently supporting around 200 languages. And you can actually use it through the NLTK package in, package in Python. So basically what you can do is you can read it in and it's a few lines of, of text. We can, again, share a tutorial for that. And pretty much it allows you to find synonyms for any of the words in your document that you want to work with. So it gives you a little bit more richness, but you're also kind of locked to putting words that are synonymous in categorical boxes, which may not be accurate sometimes. You know what I mean? Like It can get complicated. I mean, that's... Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So, um, the NLTK package is is truly a package. Like oh, it could yeah. be pip install. Yes. Right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so NLTK is a number another one of those workhorses. Um, I think we didn't mention actually the packages for stemming and lemmatization, but NLTK has some of the most important uh, packages for that as well. And it's it's a lot of fun to play with. There's actually uh, really cool resources. A lot of overlap. It sounds yeah. like between these exactly. Things. Okay. All right. So let's say we don't want to use WordNet. Let's say we want to do something a little bit more flexible. We don't want to stick everything in boxes. So something that we can do instead is use what's called word embeddings. You might have also heard of the most common pack, uh, sorry, the most common model used for word embeddings, which is called word to vec And what word embeddings essentially try to do is capture part of the meaning of words rather than just representing them as there or not there. Okay. So just briefly, word to vect is actually spelled with a number two in mm -hmm. it and then VEC for vector yeah. kind of. Uh, so we're kind of moving words into vectors, which is a term that comes up so much in this. Yes. This idea of, I guess, sort of directionality. Yes. And, and strength, you know, what a vector can can be, this sort of a line mm -hmm. um, where it's headed. Okay. So how does this help to add some of this additional meaning, kind of going beyond the the sort of grouping that we've been doing up to now? Yeah. So it's a bit of an abstract concept. So I'm going to try and break it down as much as possible. But you know, if you want a little bit more detail, again, we're sharing documents um, or really good articles. Yeah, lots of links. Yeah, lots of links, <laughs> lots of links. So basically what they do is they take every single word in a collection of documents again, but this time instead of just extracting the word, you extract that word within its sentence context. So it doesn't have to be this whole sentence. It's usually like a window of, you know, a few words on each side. And then what you do is you feed them into the word to vec model. And what the word to vec model is trying to predict is the words that are most likely to co-occur co with your target word. So to make it a bit more concrete, let's say that we have the word queen. And it probably co-occurs with words like crown, castle, court, and dress. And then let's say we have the word king. And it probably co-occurs with crown, 
castle and court. And then let's say we have the word woman and it may co-occur with dress. So what the model would learn is that king and queen are strongly related as they tend to co-occur in the same context and queen and woman are more weakly related because they occur in some of the same context but not others. Does that make sense? Hmm. Yeah, it really kind of gets to this next idea of before you you were literally just throwing words into a bag and and they no longer had relationships. They were just, you know, somebody could sort through the bag in whatever order they mm-hmm. wanted to and just toss them in there and say, hey, this is what the meaning is based on this. But 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 this word came after this word and that means something. Yes. <laughs> and uh or you know or around it. And so like I could see how somebody explaining to somebody else that what they said to them or wrote to them was hate speech could be classified as hate speech itself mm-hmm. in the earlier models whereas in this one it could you know have an explanation yep <laughs> you know have a context to it where it would no longer you know mean that and it could you know i don't know i think of like there's so many of these tools that are out there that are trying to do a lot of this and you could kind of see it uh, it, it's like, yeah, you missed all the context of what was happening. So that, that seems to help. And then th- it's interesting, like how, do, how do these get developed, I guess, in some ways, do you get to set the size of the window? <laughs> yes. Um, yeah. Or, Cause I guess that would, it, again, you talked about lemmatization taking up being expensive. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. <laughs> I could see this being very expensive too. <laughs> Interestingly, actually, so these models used to be pretty slow to train, but we'll come to the most pop- popular package for implementing them, GenSim, a little bit later on. And smaller models are actually like, they're really fast now. Okay, good. I've trained smaller models with maybe, like they, they didn't really have enough data for training, to be honest, but they had maybe like 60,000 documents. And they probably trained in half an hour, like mm. just on my my very old MacBook Pro at home. But we'll, we'll kind of talk about how you can, you know, train real beefy prop, proper models and, you know, the, the uh, options for that as well. Okay. It, it's very, very possible to do these at home and most people will develop their own word to vec models from scratch and they are, they are fun to play with. They're like magic, but... We'll come to that. We'll come to that. We'll, we'll talk a little bit more about how they develop first. Okay. So what I want to talk about is what the vector is in word to vec You remember we were talking about this table earlier where what we did with the bag of words models is we had columns across the top representing every single word and then yeah. the rows are representing the documents. So it's a bit different with word to vec Basically what we have is words down the side rather than whole documents. And this time the columns represent some sort of aspect of meaning about the words that the model has worked out itself. So we don't we don't create this table. It's created as part of the model generation process. And it's not really for us to interpret what each of the feature columns mean, but they do kind of represent some part of how words relate and differ from each other. So I have another example because, it again, it's a bit of a weird concept. Yeah. Let, Feels yeah. like we're moving toward the black boxiness. <laughs> yeah, of, we are getting there. Of, of machine learning. <laughs> yes. We're like, I don't know. It just does it. Yes. <laughs> God, imagine being asked this in an interview as well. I, I once got asked how one of these models worked in an interview and I was like, okay, I can't explain this, but could you have asked about linear regression? That would have been nicer. Yes. <laughs> uh, nice. So, okay. So let's imagine we have six words that we're trying to compare. So we have queen and king, woman and man, and girl and boy. And let's say that our model has worked out three feature columns for us. So what we can do is compare these words in how they differ and and how they're similar on each of these feature columns. So let's say we look at the first of the features and we can see that it's really similar between all of them. So maybe what this feature is representing is something to do with personhood. And then maybe girl and boy are similar on one feature and man and woman are similar, but they're different from each other. So maybe this feature is representing age and maybe king and queen have different values to man and woman and girl and boy on a third feature 
So maybe this represents something to do with class or royalty. So I think you can kind of see how we're going with this. Like it's it's something that the model has like developed a concept of based on what you're showing it, but it doesn't really matter. Like all it matters is that man and woman will end up being kind of similar. Girl and boy will end up being kind of similar and king and queen will end up being kind of similar. Okay. And, you know, obviously three features is not that much. So another parameter that you can set in these models is you tell the model how many features you want it to develop. So usually have at least a hundred. And then what this is, is the vector representing each word. So I'll have like a hundred dimension or a hundred length vector for queen. And it has just all of these features that my model has dreamed up for me. When you talk about it being like this, these hundred parameters in the past, when this was developed and, and kind of come up with, there was much more hands-on in, in training how these tools sort of work. And so I kind of wonder about like, you know, you were saying at this point, you can say, hey, go from three to, you know, 27 to mm. 200, mm-hmm. you know, whatever value you want it to sort of generalize these features to to be. Mm. What I kind of wonder about is a couple things. One, is there a diminishing returns that you get by trying to have it do too many features where it's just sort of spinning its wheels and can't think of anything else? And then I, I wonder also then is, is some of the training already been done? Like... I guess it get is it different per project like as you go to train something for a specific task as you kind of build that up like do you, you're kind of restructuring these these features mm. each time This is actually two very interesting questions so in terms of yeah the number of dimensions there are diminishing returns past a certain point so it's actually like a statistical artifact but in dimensional spaces that are too big like you can no longer really detect distances between things that are actually close to each other so okay yeah so it it actually screws things up if you go too high and is that kind of like the overfitting issue that happen in i mean is i mean it's related maybe in a way yeah it's it's a bit different it's almost like um yeah, like it's it's kind of related to overfitting in the sense that you try to extract too much meaning when it, it it's not there because like you said, like the model just can't squeeze anything else out to represent in these feature vectors. Right. And it might only understand this document at that point because mm-hmm. it's analyzed it so deeply mm-hmm. and it's fitted to that document as opposed to being more generally useful yeah or or it could just be like i don't know there's just not that much variance in the text (laughs) so there's just like sure there's just not really much for the model to (laughs) say depends on the author yeah 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 yeah. (laughs) we're not going to name any names (laughs) (laughs) and yeah in terms of what you're talking about this this idea of like can we can we have some of the training already done totally so this is something that will become a bit more salient in the next section when we're talking about the current models like current generation of of models but there's something called pre-training and this is where companies usually that have access to a lot of GPU, usually, they will train these massive general purpose models. So like uh, a really famous one is Google trained a whole bunch of like a a really big word to back model on the Wikipedia corpus. And Mm. yeah, and so you can basically take these models and use them to sort of continue with your model training. So this is a concept that's called fine-tuning. And it basically means you can take a whole bunch of training work that's done already with a general understanding of the differences between words and then tune it to your specific use case. Okay. And that's actually one other important thing to say. The differences or the the way that words are represented in these models is entirely context specific so it really depends on like the text you used so like a example that you know obviously came up a lot at this job board was if we were training for the difference between python and java 
it would be really similar <laughs> because Python and Java would occur in the same sort of job ads. Whereas if, you know, I was using this Google model trained on Wikipedia, they're going to be really different because one's a snake and the other one's an island or a type of coffee. So. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. I guess that, yeah, that kind of adds the uh, interesting things there that, that this is trying in some ways to work out mm. is the, almost the use of the word more than necessarily the, the meaning of it per se. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And it's kind of a, a strength and a, I would say weakness of this model. And we'll talk about why in the next section a little bit more, but let's talk about the good bit, which is how to do this in Python. Yeah. Yeah. So we talked a little bit about GenSim. I think you're actually looking at the PyPy documentation, right? Yeah. Yeah. When I went on and kind of brought up the project, the actual PyPI site for GenSim version four had a lot of really good resources to kind of play with. Not only is there like a quick start documentation, but mm -hmm. a, a set of tutorials, official and, and otherwise. And uh, I think it would be a really good place to kind of get in and kind of play with it. I think there are a variety of <laughs> there's this term corpus yes yes <laughs> right uh, um sort of the documents that we're talking mm -hmm. about uh, it, it crawling over a, and, and they called it a corpora yeah 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah so these are i don't know i always get kind of the word corpse oh, stuck no. in my head and it's not <laughs> and i'm like no it's corpus <laughs> well it's dead text <laughs> yeah, so you know <laughs> exactly in some ways yeah, yeah on dead trees yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway yeah i think there's some some good resources there to kind of dig into GenSim, mm. which is nice. You mentioned some projects that were kind of more bag of words types of mm. stuff that you were doing before. Um, what kinds of things were you doing here? Aha. Uh -huh. So word to vec is one of my great loves in terms of models. So I've used it for a lot of different things. I think the last project I did with GenSim with word to vec was... Um, so it was during, uh, our lockdown Christmas and, um, okay. I was really bored. And so I ended up doing a blog post where I found a collection of Christmas recipes and I trained a word to Vec model so that I could recommend the most appropriate recipes based on, you know, something you might be interested in making. So you would input, you know, I don't know, roast turkey and it would output roast duck. So hmm. that was a fun little project. I think it only took me like, I don't know, a couple of hours to do the whole thing. What were you using as your resource for recipes? So I found actually, this is a great resource for text data, actually. Um, Kaggle. Kaggle has amazing data sets. Yeah, yeah. Yes. So someone very kindly had scraped a whole bunch of recipes from BBC Good Food, and then they uploaded that mm. as this beautiful, very well-ordered data set. So that's what I use for that. But something I also wanted to say is I was super intimidated by the idea of using word to vec before I started using it. It is like one of those packages. It's literally like three lines of code. It is so easy to use. And... Once you sort of create your own word to vec model, um, what you do is like you query it for the most similar terms. And it really, it honestly feels like magic, the stuff it returns. It's kind of crazy. Like you put in happy and it'll return glad, happiness. Like it, it's really extraordinary. You could build a thesaurus project <laughs> real quick. <laughs> yeah, you could, you could. Yeah, so you can also use this for like, if we go back to our text classification, you can basically, you know, take all of the words that you have in your document and you can just average over the vectors for each word. And then essentially you have the average meaning of a text that's based on the words it contains. So then you can feed that into a machine learning model to classify or get sentiment analysis. And that just gives you an input other than those bag of words that we talked about before. Yeah, cool. Yeah. And so most of this, again, it sounds like we're still running it kind of locally and mm -hmm. can kind of play with it without kind of too much of an investment, just more time, just learning how to do it and, and finding good resources to kind of keep learning from it. Yeah. These sound like fun takeaways that people can kind of start messing with. Yeah. We're almost up to an hour. And so I'm wondering if we should maybe tease what we're going to get into next, but then also we can kind of talk about, since there may be a little break here, you've been busy doing a lot of other things. <laughs> 
And I kind of wanted maybe to give you a chance to shout out some of the the things that you've been doing and, and um, maybe some of the upcoming talks and other things that you're, you've been up to, Jody. Give you a chance to yeah. so that people to follow what you're doing online. <laughs> sure. We want to start with what's coming up next for our upcoming conversation. Yeah. So in our next conversation, what I want to get into a little bit more is the current generation of models. So we already talked about those a little bit at the beginning What I want to do is, it won't be a deep dive because I don't really think a podcast is the right format for trying to explain these, but just an overview of why these models were developed, sort of their general kind of underlying training and how they're created. And yeah, yeah. okay. And then talk a bit more about two of the most popular ones, uh, which is BERT and the GPT models. There's kind of a lot of history there too, to kind of go through. Like, I mean, literally the GPT ones are numbered. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. <laughs> maybe we could talk about the the generations there. And then I, I, the BERT one seems like they're having fun with the different namings for uh, <laughs> oh my, the uses for it. <laughs> my God, it, a bit of a spoiler for next week, but my favorite is a, a French BERT called Camembert. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's good. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> cool. Yeah, so we can kind of dive into that stuff and and also give you, you know, again, resources to not only learn more, but to hopefully play with some of the stuff in ways that, mm. that you can kind of get into it. And, you know, obviously tie it to what we were talking about, again, at the very beginning of this whole thing of where the stuff is being kind of used all around you right now. Yes. <laughs> and so, cool. So what have you been up to? What how can people kind of follow the things that you're doing? Yeah. So yesterday I just completed a webinar on vectorization and how it can be used to speed up Python code. So that's actually been recorded online if you want to catch that. So upcoming, I will be attending a few conferences. I have a speaking slot at PyCon Portugal. So if you'll be coming to that, I'd love to see you there. Um, I'll actually be giving a presentation on this topic. So we'll be able to go over that in a bit more detail with some code examples. Yeah, nice. Yeah. And then I'll also be presenting at NDC Oslo, also in September, talking a bit about data cleaning and screening and how you can work out if your data is actually going to be any good for machine learning model. What's the what's the name there? NDC? Yes, the Norwegian Developers Conference. Okay, great. <laughs> and also, yeah. nice. Yeah, yeah. Not a Python conference. It's actually traditionally a .NET conference, so I feel pretty lucky to have snagged a spot. Uh, so that'll be quite exciting. Okay. And uh, yeah, I'll also be presenting at a conference called Big Data London, um, and I'll be talking with a colleague there about sort of uh, the roles of data engineers versus data scientists within an organization. Awesome. Yeah, busy, busy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Not slowing down for the summer here. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> well, Jody, thanks so much for coming on the show. And I'm excited to keep talking to you on these topics. And here's to uh, <laughs> to our conversation in a couple <laughs> weeks here. Yeah, I'm, I'm really looking forward to it as well. And yeah, thanks so much. It was an absolute blast being able to explain this today. And I cannot wait to tell you the rest of the story. All right. And don't forget, Sneak is the developer security platform that's loved by devs and trusted by security. Sign up for free at sneak.co slash realpython. That's S-N-Y-K dot C-O slash realpython. I want to thank Jody Birchall for coming on the show this week. And I want to thank you for listening to the Real Python podcast. Make sure that you click that follow button in your podcast player. And if you see a subscribe button somewhere, remember that the Real Python podcast is free. If you like the show, please leave us a review. You can find show notes with links to all the topics we spoke about inside your podcast player or at realpython.com slash podcast. And while you're there, you can leave us a question or a topic idea. I've been your host, Christopher Bailey, and I look forward to talking to you soon.